Great. Uh, welcome, everybody, to our water and sewer deep dive. Uh, my name is Danielle DeVries. You all know me. Uh, tonight, we have in the room with me Shannon helping on the computer stuff again. Uh, and then we have Dustin and Stephen from the Engineering Services Department helping out with our presentations. And we also have Tanya and Anita on line with us from Interior Health. Um, I'd like to start off with a couple reminders again. Uh, first, that we are gathered tonight on the unceded territories of the Seal people. Uh, the presentations tonight are a little bit of a different format from the last meeting, so hopefully we do have more time for conversations and questions afterwards. Uh, we do still have tight time. There's very little we can do within two hours. So we'll try to keep the presentations as tight as possible and hopefully address as many of your questions as possible. And we will do the same thing, put together a document with all of the questions asked afterwards so that you can see everything and we can put that publicly available again. Um, and then lastly, this is being recorded, so the YouTube will go online just like it did last time. And I won't spend any more time giving you guys info. I will hand it over now to Dustin, uh, who will be presenting on the liquid waste management plan. And I will share the screen. As long as you're hovering on this, you should be able to click. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Dustin Zahara. I'm with the engineering uh, with the RDOS. Uh, I've been asked here tonight to discuss the current project involving Naramata being the liquid waste management plan. Uh, we're working through a the liquid waste management plan for the general area of, of area E and specifically centered on the village core in Naramata. Uh, this project makes use of as and is it uh, completed in conjunction with uh, the OCP. Does that? Oh, there we go. So uh, what is an, a liquid waste management plan? It's uh, a guideline uh, similar to an OCP valid for five to 10 years and authorizes us as a local government to proceed with approved infrastructure development, uh, including borrowing required to finance that infrastructure. Uh, the liquid waste management plan is a guidance document that brings together uh, at the request of community members uh, a plan for managing liquid waste. Uh, there's many reasons for completing a liquid waste management plan. Two of the primary objectives are the protection of health of people in the environment, and second, to properly consult those uh, included individuals, uh, residents. Additional objectives include being cost effective, protecting our drinking water source, conserving energy and water, uh, mitigating climate effects by reducing greenhouse gas production. Uh, through this plan, we're planning to uh, or looking at centralizing sewage management systems and the benefits they can provide to the community. So the last liquid waste management plan was uh, 28 years ago. That's a long time for uh, to gap a liquid waste management plan. And as a result of that, we've seen significant impact to the to the lake, uh, the foreshore surrounding Naramata. There, we have conducted a recent study uh, that that found these impacts and so that we could have uh, data to help us focus our efforts on high impact areas surrounding the uh, lower growth area of the village of Naramata. This will become our first phase. 
we have outlined four phases. Uh, the second phase is the hilltops immediately north and south of, of the village core. The third phase would be up Arowana into the Outlook area. And the fourth phase would be the whole area, uh, the whole service area surrounding Naramata or the water service area. So liquid waste management plan includes three stages. Uh, we're currently in the first stage and that's the collection of background data, understanding uh, the current conditions affecting Naramata and working with the OCP to plan for future development. Uh, we, we will put together or have put together a list of options, uh, including pros and cons for uh, starting with continuing as status quo and going through up through a full community sewer system. Throughout each stage, we will have meetings with uh, technical members and, and public, and we will release information through social media, through traditional media, mail-outs. Uh, we will do our best to keep residents fully informed of the progress that we've made. Uh, stage two would be shortlisting options. Uh, we'll narrow down to make it something that we can decide between one or two options and work through a rough design process to better understand the, the cost of each of these shortlisted options. Stage three is compiling the results of, of the process and producing a schedule to implement the selected option uh, and deciding on how we will fund that, that infrastructure that we decide on. Um, again, we, we will present our findings at each stage and give the community an opportunity to discuss and approve anything that we provide as an option. Uh, once all of this is completed, then we'll submit the plan to the ministry for approval. Uh, the three stage format is, is a, a, guide, a, a result of guidelines provided by the province for preparing liquid waste management plans some other regulations that help us to select a process include provincial and federal wastewater regulations as well as sewerage system regulations these regulations result in approved operations permits uh, that ultimately put limits on our final effluent The committees that meet uh, include uh, three separate committees, the steering, uh, technical, and public committees. The steering committee is mainly RDOS staff and the consultant completing the liquid waste management plan. Uh, we have McElhaney completing ours. Uh, the technical committee includes design professionals uh, wastewater operators and construction experts, uh, as well as ministry representative representatives and local indigenous uh, community members. The public advisory committee includes a select number of, of residents, uh, neighbors and developers within the, the community of Naramata. Uh, 
committees are, are helping us to collect technical information and comments sur surrounding the benefits of each potential si uh, system. Ensuring that the technical information is relayed well to achieve uh, public approval and, and resulting in a, a path forward that is well informed, thought out and generally approved by residents as well as the ministry. As a part of our process, we will release uh, a number of surveys seeking to gather feedback through each stage of the process. Uh, again, information will be released through traditional media, social media, mail outs, and, and our liquid waste management website on regional connections. We, as a part of the process, will identify every location that may have some merit towards being a location that has uh, a low impact on the community while providing a high level of service and is a cost effective solution. Each identified site will be thoroughly evaluated and with the aim of avoiding disruption of two environmentally sensitive lands and we will include discussion at each uh, committee meeting on these locations. As a result, we hope to select one or two optimal locations to further investigate in stage two on the costing. Um, whichever location is selected at the end of this will need to be approved by the community. Uh, this is a separate project, but something that is good to know about. So last summer, there was a referendum held in Kaledin uh, to approve the funding from New Building Canada Fund. That was a grant for $6.6 uh, and required $3.3 million of, of community funds. This, was, this referendum failed. Um, as a result, there's now 6.2 million remaining, and we're looking at repurposing the proposal for Naramata. Um, the proposal came as a result of uh, a group of developers from Naramata approaching the RDOS with a plan to provide uh, a portion of the funding required to pay for the one third um, money that we would need to put up for the grant. We have submitted that, that proposal and are awaiting feed, uh, uh, approval from the federal government. Uh, one issue is, is that this whole project needs to be done by March 31st of next year, 2023. Uh, so next steps would be progressing into stages two and three. Uh, we, have, we are planning to combine those stages, and uh, after, after that has happened, then we will submit to the Ministry for approval. Uh, that's uh, just a couple of pictures of what some plants could look like, and uh, we can take questions. Hey. Thank you, Dustin. I'm going to stop sharing the screen here, maybe. Yes, here we go. Wonderful. Okay, uh, we have quite a bit of time, so I'm hopeful we can address a lot of your questions. I do see one hand up already, and I've got a few questions in front of me. A couple hands up, yay. All right, uh, I'm just going to work down the list. Uh, Richard, you can unmute yourself. You're welcome to turn on your camera too, if you like. I love seeing your faces. I regret that, uh, it, um, Danielle, but uh, anyway, I've uh, unmuted myself and uh, put my video on. Uh, thank you, Dustin, for, the, uh, for this information. Um, it, it strikes me that 
uh, the critical, the most critical component out of this entire discussion or the entire uh, situation around sewers is the liquid wastewater uh, management plan. Would you agree with that? Um, that, that, I mean, that's our guiding document, so yes. Thank you. And uh, when do you think that it will be completed? So we're just finishing stage one right now. Uh, it's typically about an 18 month process, but we're trying to squeeze that down to, to finish as soon as possible. I still okay, would expect you. it to take a year. Uh, in order to properly consult everybody, it, it's going to take that much time. That that seems reasonable to me, uh, considering all the steps that were involved. Um, well, in that case, I find it a little bit alarming that um, uh, seemingly at the uh, uh, at the instigation of develop uh, local developers that. Um, the, the possibility of moving ahead on the sewage system is almost a fait accompli. Uh, it's not a done deal at this point. It's just okay. an option. Uh, that we... not, <laughs> that's not reassuring me too much. Um, the, it, the fact that it's not a done deal um, uh, let me put it another way. Uh, it seems to me before any discussion of a sewage system in the uh, village, um, you know, whether it's uh, the developers are paying for part of it or anything else, that the liquid wastewater management pl uh, plan should be completed, uh, should have full public input and be completed uh, prior to uh, any consideration being given to go ahead uh, on a sewage system. Certainly that that is the case, but in this case, we were just trying to make use of grant funds that, that are available to us and, and soon to not be available to us. That's part of why we're trying to speed up the liquid waste management plan a little bit. Okay, uh, great. So it, nothing will go ahead uh, in terms of uh, decision made on the sewage system until the liquid wastewater management uh, plan is, is finalized. Is that correct? Yes, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Richard. I'm going to move down the list here to Nicole. Hold on, you're muted. Okay, Am we should I... be able to hear you. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, by now, do you have to turn to the demand that all existing small and old houses to be connected to the sewer system uh, in Aramata, in the village? Or the existing houses, can they still use their own septic tank and septic fill? Because I just put one in the fall, hoping 10 years ago that you will have it, but now I don't really want it in my backyard. So, um, do you have the authority to do that? Forcing people to have it? We would not. Or can force I just anything. be the levy of 20,000 and not be hooked up if I don't want to? Like we you did not. in West Bank? Uh. We would not force anybody. It would be unethical. Uh, it would be likely for future development only, or if you ran into the to the situation where you needed to hook up due to like a failing septic system. Yeah. Okay. So but, I don't have to worry about having to after I put over twenty thousand dollars to do brand new stuff to have to do it again. Good. Uh, my other question is um, where you're planning to have the treatment facility system in Aramata, <clears throat> which are the best uh, suited uh, area to put a treatment plant um, and not impacting people that live nearby? Because I've heard that they might do it right next to me at the Naramata Center Park right here on Illis. There's certainly no... Because that's uh, think. There's certainly no decisions 
have been made yet. Um, a few sites have been identified as being open and available, but, but no decisions have been made yet. That, that'll be stage two. Uh, the stage one plan that we're working on right now still needs to be approved by the ministry before we can progress to stage two. So um, okay. that's a little, little ways off, but. Uh, still something to think about. Right. I, I think if you're talking about the ball field or like the camping area there of, of is that the spot that you're talking yeah, that's, about? Yeah, that would be the one. So, um, I mean, that is an open field, so that's, it hasn't been suggested, but that. No, no, I don't want it because then the whole village is going to stink during tourist time and it's not going to be very valuable for the group that bought the packing house and an amateur center. So you'll have to put it somewhere where it's not going to stink. And especially not in my backyard. But I do agree that we do need a source system somehow in our meta because environmentally, it's not a bad idea and that should have been done 20 years ago. And where are you going to divert that water? <clears throat> Because Sorry? you cannot put it in shallow water. You cannot put that water, just the leftover soil system back into the lake near uh, shallow water because that's not ethical and it's not very good for our water. And what about Merit when they have the soil system overflowing all over the village of Merit? We, uh, we would have guidelines on uh, within our OC that would that would dictate how much effluent would go out as well as the quality of that effluent and we operate a system in okay falls that that has very little if any smell um and and the water that goes out is is technically cleaner uh than than the river water that's going into uh, Stephen, do you have something to add? Yeah, it's Stephen Juke here. Um, you have really good questions, and that's what the process of the liquid waste management plan does: is we explore all the technical um, options for us, including where are the where are the best locations in the area, because it is quite site specific, and also what happens to the, the 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 treated the treated water like all all of that is is discussed and um, and determined in in the liquid waste management plan. My other question: <clears throat> the system that you're going to be using, what they be what they call uh, ultra light or whatever that does clean the water, will be better than the other system that they have right now in Pinkington. But at the same time. It's very costly to maintain and everything, but we have to realize that we are going to be pumping the water for us to drink on a regular basis. And if the lake gets too hot, then the bacteria develop, and then we might have another problem in our hand. That's, that's certainly choices that would come out of the liquid waste management plan on, on what type of system we would use. It, it's not something that we have explored yet should be that's it for me for now thanks nicole okay i'm looking at questions in front of me from david that are somewhat related um and is talking about the one hectare policy a little bit but um just pushing the point nicole asked are people going to have the option to opt into the system if they're in the village and they'd like to be on it rather than their septic? We don't, uh, again, we're not that far in the liquid waste management plan, so we, we don't have those things ironed out yet. Um, certainly everybody that wants to be on it, we will do our best to make sure that you're, you have it available to you if that's the decision that is made by, through the liquid waste management plan. Okay, thank you. Um, and then 
I have questions from Skulk here as well. And both Skulk and David have mentioned there's a one hectare rule in the OCP and it speaks to one hectare parcels one hectare and less uh, being required to enter a community sewer system. I, I don't think that's the case. That's in relation if they want to subdivide. Mm -hmm. So we do have a one hectare rule and that is speaking specifically to new parcels. If they're trying to subdivide uh, and they are not connected to a community sewer, then they have to be at least one hectare in size. If they want to go smaller than one hectare, then they have to be connected to a community system. Is that right? Yes. Um, okay, I saw Stephanie's hand next. Stephanie, please go ahead. Great. Thanks a lot, Danielle. So I, I think it's important to um, just point out that we're in the, you know, this is a plan, a process that has to be undertaken. And on that, um, David, the current um, LWMP that you're working on, this is just for the village at this point, right? And then you'll look at the hilltops of Narawana and the whole service area. Is that my, is that correct to my understanding? Exactly, yes. Okay, so in each one of those po uh, processes is going to take a year to 18 months. So we're quite a ways down the road <laughs> for getting um, some answers about things going on in the hilltop areas, right? Yes. Yeah, because there's been a, a number of concerns uh, voiced to me as chair about um, why a publicly owned a sewage system isn't under consideration for other areas. Um, so I guess there's no way of fast tracking these processes. We're just kind of under the gun and behind the eight ball here, right? Um, I think the answer is yes to that, so I'll carry on. <laughs> um, the, the the point that Richard made, I think, is one of the ones that has really gotten a number of uh, residents concerned, and that is that development by private developers going on in the village right now is not going to drive a public septic system or sewage system. Uh, for the village and it's not going to take precedent their their requirements or needs will not take precedent over the LWMP plan and I, I think that just needs to be really clarified that uh, what I heard from you is that um, the LWMP plan will proceed for the village and nothing will be done for future development until such time as that LWMP plan is complete is that correct Yeah, this is Stephen Duke again. Um, yeah, the liquid waste management plan is uh, a, a project that we are undertaking right now. It, it is separate from everything else. It's just like, as, as Dustin said, it's the it, it's a, it's a basically a, an OCP for for liquid waste management. Um, you know, it, it it's trying to um, uh, investigate things and and plan out for for the future for liquid waste. Um, the the grant that was mentioned um, that is right now just an opportunity uh, for us to utilize a grant that that we have um, that unfortunately hasn't been used and we have a certain a limited amount of time to use it. So we are trying to uh, see if we're even allowed to reallocate those funds. Um, but yeah, the liquid waste management plan is, is, a, is a total separate uh, project to actually getting a, a, a sanitary system in there now. Uh, we have to have that done first. So, so in the meantime, uh, people under, that are undertaking development in the heart of the village will either have to have their own plan in place, like their own uh, septic liquid management plan, um, and, and system, I guess, or, or wait until ours is done. Is that how it goes? I guess I'm a little confused on that. Well, certainly, um, there, it, these, these type of plants, the, let's say private, private plants, um, those are not regulated by, um, the regional district. Um, it is a, it, it's regulated by the province. So if they 
you know, it, 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 it's, it's a total separate thing if, 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 and, and they're under separate regulations. Our liquid waste management plan um, is uh, basically a, a plan to develop a, uh, a sanitary system or whatever option um, comes out uh, uh, for, for the next period of time, like 20 years. Um, if it turns out to be, as, as it is now, the existing liquid waste management plan, it says the best option for the community is on-site septic. Um, so we're, we're now reviewing that plan and seeing if there's another better option for it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, I have some clarifications in the comments here from Lisa, the manager of the engineering services department. Um, she says every location will be looked at for a future plant and odor control is definitely one of the most important factors in any design. So it is being considered in this process. Um, and at this point in the study, we don't have a lot of specific answers as to the technology that will be used. I'm going to jump down to Greg's question here just because I think it's important um, that we are all talking about the same thing. So he's asking, are private systems such as what Outlook has considered a community sewer system? And are we calling both an RDOS run system and privately run systems uh, community sewer systems? Or do they have separate terminology? Yeah, community sewer system is basically multiple users of the same system um, and under under the definition of a of a community system a uh, organization like federal provincial municipal local governments can operate these um, also private corporations uh, strata corporations um, a, a separate entity basically has to operate a community system, not not an individual. Um, so you can have a private community system. There are a few of them out in Naramata and, and throughout the regional district. Um, but yeah, that's that's generally the definition of. Thank you. Um, jumping back up to my list, Sorry, I thought Danielle, you guys... it's Anita. Can I just add yes. a touch to that? Um, there is a difference in governance. So we're talking about utilities, typically uh, the governance structure, how people make decisions or the, the organization makes decisions about um, assets and maintenance and just decisions about how to manage the system, whether it's sewage or water. Uh, for drinking water systems, we've found that um, publicly owned uh, systems, which have regional directors and a, a strong governance structure as to how to make decisions, uh, they have, they operate better and they have um, less, less poor, there's less instances of poor water quality with systems governed by a, 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 an elected body versus uh, private companies or otherwise. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, jumping back up to the top of the chat here, Deb asked a question, has the lake been tested for contamination? Yes, well, there was a recent study conducted to uh, investigate the amount of contamination within the foreshore of Naramata. And what was that? Results? Sorry? Just wondering what the results were. We we found that there is contaminate contamination at a a, a few select sites. Uh, generally, the whole area is seeing impact uh, as a result of sewage uh, septic systems. Thank you. Um, Cheryl is waiting patiently. Please go ahead and unmute. Oh. I, um, I wanted to just make a comment and then ask a question. Um, we're doing our deep dives individually on topic and I'm trying to respect that, but it does concern me um, greatly how I believe the um, public sewer system uh, 
in the future in Naramata is going to impact what our village looks like with the current zoning of medium density. If you read the definition of medium density, I just don't think our village is going to look anything like it um, itself once we have a sewer system. There will be just a, a lot more development interest and it's going to be, um, I think it's really going to change the character of our village. So that's my comment. Um, having said that, of course, I'm concerned about the water quality around Naramata and thanks for sharing the results, although I'm a little unclear what sites we're supposed to avoid when we're swimming. It'd be helpful if we knew that. Um, I also want to know what uh, kind of costs other communities have experienced when they've um, uh, transitioned to, um, to sewer systems. I, I don't have uh, that data readily available, but it's something that I can uh, look into and see what I can provide for you later. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. And I'll address your comment a little bit on medium density. Uh, right now in the village, only things that are zoned and designated in the OCP as Naramata Village Centre can be medium density, which is up to three stories tall or 12 meters. Um, and I believe it does have a maximum number of units, but I don't have it in my memory. Uh, so it could be a low rise apartment, but that's only for the first three blocks or so of Robson, as it's currently uh, designated. Everywhere else in the village could have more density than it does if a sewer system were to be built. Uh, but the way that looks is that um, properties under one hectare right now cannot have a suite or an accessory dwelling unless they're on a community sewer. So um, most people in the village, if they do have a suite, it has to be on the same septic system as the rest of the main house. So we could see more suites and carriage houses potentially because they are already allowed in the zoning with the condition that it has to be connected to a community system. Um, but it, we wouldn't suddenly have townhouses or apartments everywhere in the village without changes to both the OCP and uh, the zoning for those properties. Um, I believe Richard raised his hand next. Thank you, Danielle. Um, yeah, I, uh, this is a remark that is directed to everybody on the citizen advisory group. Um, I, I would like to strongly echo Cheryl's comments about uh, what a sewer system will uh, potentially foster in the village as far as development is concerned. Uh, there will be the possibility of much higher density uh, if there is a sewage system. Right now, everybody is on septic and uh, that, that limits the amount of density that you can get. But as soon as the sewer system goes in, that all changes. Now you can look at much higher densities, uh, you know, rows and rows of townhouses, you name it, uh, apartment buildings and so forth. Uh, admittedly, uh, as Daniel, uh, Danielle said, there is only a certain area where that is currently permitted. However, you know, you can be sure that developers will push uh, for uh, rezoning and so forth uh, so that they can uh, build at a higher density. So what I'm saying is the, the sewage system sounds wonderful. Uh, everybody likes the idea of, uh, you know, keeping our lake clean and everything. However, the sewage, uh, sewage system uh, going into Naramata village will profoundly change the character of the village. So that's something to keep in mind. Thank you. Um, just waiting here. Um, Anita, do you have a clarification? Uh, yeah, I was just going to comment um, for when Cheryl was speaking about or asking about the cost of uh, community sewer systems. Um, I just wanted to add that when we think about 
the cost of a community sanitary system. We also have to remember that septic systems aren't, I know from a day-to-day -day basis, you don't have costs, but all septic systems will fail at some point. And so when you're thinking into the future about the cost of a sanitary system, you also have to compare that to your future costs of having your own septic system. And just to keep that in mind, not just it's zero cost for one and lots of money for the other. Uh, they both have costs as you look into the future. You know, the board room's muted. Thanks, Adrian. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm chatting away. Um, Skulk had a question in the Q&A. It just went away on me. Um, can medium density be developed on institutional land, i.e. Naramata Center? Um, the primary purpose of that land and its designation and zoning is for institutional use. So they do have dorms and they could have dorms, but it could not be housing unless they rezoned and uh, sold parts of the land. Um, there's another question here. If hooking up is optional, then will it be user pays? How will capital costs uh, long-term be funded? The funding structure is something that we would decide in stage three of the plan. So uh, at this time, we don't know how, how the money is going to be uh, collected to, to pay for the operation, but uh, it certainly will be discussed in, uh, in stage three. And if people are electing to get in, would there be DCCs or is that something else to be Again, discussed? We, yeah, we would figure that out in stage three. Okay. Thank you. Um, Adrian, you have your hand up. I saw you have some uh, questions in the chat as well. Do you want to ask them? Uh, no, I, I wanted to make a comment about densification in the village. Um, just, I know change in the landscape can, uh, you know, can kind of be scary, but um, from an affordable housing perspective, being able to add carriage houses down in the village um, I think would be rather beneficial. Um, we can always look at something creative uh, like vacation houses are limited only to accessory, dwell accessory dwellings or carriage suites. So I think that there's ways that we can be creative with uh, additional space in the backyard or even capping how big those houses are. But, um, you know, if we can keep some of those restrictions on uh, changing, like, uh, changing land use and things like that. Like if we can be restrictive there, then we may be able to cap, or we may be able to minimize uh, townhouses or uh, high rises going in. But I think from a carriage suite accessory accessory dwelling perspective, I think it would be beneficial to be able to have those. Okay, thank you. Um, and you also have questions in the comments, so I'll direct this one to Stephen. Um, once Outlook comes on board or the Naramata Benchland system, would we take that and tie it into the upcoming system or would we have two systems? Could it be bigger? Uh, that's, that's really too far in the future to speculate. Um, they are, are quite a ways away from the village um, and that would be a, a different a different project completely. Um, they are a, a private operation. Um, you know, if your question is, would we take that over? We would have to um, basically assess it and, and review it. Um, just like we would review any other type of service that we would take over, for example, from the irrigation district. Thank you. Um, and then Adrian's last question, um, do the private funds and the grant cover the cost of the system in the village? We are 
not sure on that right now. It, it, it's the funds cover a small plant as well as some some pipe. It, it, it's if the grant is repurposed, then we still need to design the system. So we don't we don't have that information at this time. Thank you. Um, I have a clarification here in the comments. It, it went to everyone. I'll just read it now. Uh, the liquid waste management plan will proceed as planned. However, if funding comes through for the Naramata sewer project, a community system could be installed prior to the liquid waste management being fully completed. At this time, developers are requiring to put in their own mini plants, which, as Stephen indicated, are not regulated the same way as the RDOS would be. Uh, this would be an opportunity with the grant funds, uh, an opportunity rather, exists to provide something to benefit the entire community for the long term. And I also see Tanya's hand. Do you have a clarification? Yeah, hi. Um, I just I wanted to raise the point that, um, you know, the, the concern around the change that could potentially occur in the village with a, with a um, with a sewer system. Um, I think we need to keep in mind that like the purpose of the OCP is to develop the vision um, and then you know the regulations can be put in place to protect the village in the way it's it's um, the way it currently looks. So just because there might be developers and people wanting to come in doesn't mean that we have to allow um, the change and if we want to keep the village as it is in its rural character, we can put in um, like regulations and um, you know very strong statements within the OCP to help uh, secure that. Um, I also want to mention that you know having a, a septic, um, not a septic, sorry, a, a community sewer system, um, just the sustainability of it and a protection of the land that uh, with, um, you know, in in time, I think it is, well, I, Anita can maybe correct me on this, but um, it, if, if I don't hit the mark, but basically like um, all septic systems are bound to fail and when they fail they cause some you know environmental damage and um, a community septic sewer community sewer system um, really does maintain sustainability for long-term um, environmental benefits and Anita am I anything bad <laughs> okay <laughs> Okay. Thank you. That's a great transition because we are now into your time for presentation as well. Uh, Stephanie and Richard, I saw your hands. Please send me your your questions offline so we can answer them. And I saw uh, Deb and David had more questions in the side as well. Um, Director Kazakovich, do you have a clarification before I switch to Interior Health? Yes, hi, thank you, Danielle, and uh, thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Um, yeah, just a couple points. Um, Nicole had mentioned about, you know, I think Nicole mentioned about why we didn't have a sewage system 20 years ago or so. My understanding, and, and I think Lisa can correct me if I'm wrong, is from the old liquid waste management plan, it was not recommended. The community didn't need to move towards a sewage system, septic was working. Uh, fine at that time for the community. Um, the liquid waste management plan was put into uh, our work plan at the RDOS and budgeted for before this opportunity came up for possibly repurposing grant funds. So, so we were moving ahead with a, an, a liquid waste management plan no matter what. That needed to be done. We need to know the recommendations that come out of that. And then this opportunity came up. So we're waiting to find out if that gets repurposed or not and it may very well not get repurposed and if that's the case you know that essentially in my opinion slows things down um but what what has spurred things are that development will be moving forward in the sense that the bc tree fruits property if we use that as an example they have the right to go ahead and develop now they can do mixed use 
And so when we look at them putting in their own community system, as well as possibly the Naramata Center Society, possibly another developer, and they're spending one to $2 million and putting in one, two, maybe three private systems, it does seem to make sense that the money goes together if there's this grant and they put in one system that they're all on and that citizens can join in on as well. So that's just sort of the impetus of how this came about is that, you know, if this doesn't move forward right now, fine, we've got lots of time and we'll look down the road. But in my opinion, you're still going to see a system pop up or two down in the village because there are plans in place of what they're working on based on their current zoning and what's allowed in their zoning. So I just wanted everybody to be aware of that. Um, and, you know, regarding a sewer system, um, I don't think it got mentioned in our last deep dive, but several years ago, BC Housing had a proposal to put in housing down in the Naramata Centre. And um, I believe it was three phases on the Naramata Center Society property. And, and um, we had some meetings and they had some designs and it was a really nice idea, but they did pull out because there was no sewer system. So we're not able to move forward on those housing plans simply due to sewer. So something to keep in mind as we move forward with the liquid waste management plan and we see what happens with possible repurposing of these grant funds that I believe we're hoping to hear on, uh, hopefully within the next four weeks or so, if um, all moves forward with the federal and provincial government. So thank you for that uh, time, Danielle. Back to you. Great, thank you. Uh, I will hand it over to Anita and Tanya with us from Interior Health to present on um, private septic systems, uh, at sewerage systems as well. I believe Anita will be sharing her screen and I'll mute over here. Thank you. Thanks. Well, fingers crossed this all works and it comes up properly. Um, here, does that come up? We see a beautiful sunset lake. Yeah. Um, Oh, jeepers. And now it's got to that screen where I see you, but I don't have any options again. Oh, shoot. Um, oh, man. We set it up ahead of time. Um, you may be able to drag it over onto that screen, or I can um, take back presenter from you. You could try again. Okay. Uh, Sure, okay, I could try just bringing it over. Can you see that? Yep, we can see that. <clears throat> okay. Uh, okay, so maybe I'll just, I'll do presenter and go ad lib and not have my notes. <laughs> we'll just go with that. Oh, there they are, now they're on the other screen. Okay, but you guys are covering it up. Oh my goodness, all right. Okay, so hi everyone. Sorry for all of that. Um, my name is Anita Ely. I'm a specialist environmental health officer with Interior Health and the Healthy Communities team. Tanya's with me on, uh, she'll be on the chat. And if you have any questions or anything like that, maybe terminology um, that I might go over and, and not know, you can um, text her. Um, the other thing I just like to mention that I, I'm actually in Salmon Arm today. So I'm on the uh, and seated traditional and ancestral territory of the Shakratan people. Uh, so I just wanted to acknowledge that. So there we go. <clears throat> so I just wanted to uh, start with a little funny. Um, the cartoon on the left is a bit crude, as, uh, but as the saying goes, it's a picture worth a thousand words. So in rural village-sized communities, this is what we're actually dealing with. The image on the right represents more of the complexity of what is happening in our community, but the concept is the same. Contamination occurs in the environment, it moves through soil and water, and then we ingest it, and there's the potential for us to get sick. So um, in the image, there are other contaminants besides sewage. However, in Naramata and Electoral Area E, and then for today, uh, for the most part, we're talking about wastewater or sewage moving through the soil to reach ground and surface waters that are used for drinking water and recreation, such as beaches and, uh, and whatnot. Oh, there we go. 
So when we're managing exposures, I'm going to go through a little bit of this stuff and then bring it back together at the end. Um, but the idea is when we're managing exposure pathways or routes, so pathways are how something moves through the environment and the route is how does it get into your body. So there's three places that we can take um, and some action. So the first one is controlling the source of the contamination. So what hazards are in the source of contamination, pathogenic microbes, bacteria, viruses. The second part is how can these hazards move through the environment? So water typically carries them over land and through the soil. Uh, and then at the last part is, is there anything we can do to protect ourselves in case the contamination gets as far as our bodies? So we can use planning, operations and maintenance and technology to place barriers between the source of contamination, the sewage, and the hazards entering our bodies. And we've been talking about that already with this liquid-based management plan. So here there's a few examples. Uh, so for control, um, we can control the quantity and the type of sewage. So is it domestic versus industrial? Uh, can we can separate sewage and water by distance? So for example, having um, the 30 meter distance from on-site septic to drinking water. Uh, and the other one is um, uh, we can treat uh, just before it enters our body. So treating the drinking water, monitoring for water quality at beaches, closing beaches, um, if it's detected as having poor water quality. So in um, BC, all buildings with indoor plumbing must have a sewage system in compliance with the sewage system regulation. So the actual sewage system regulation is fairly short. It's only seven, or sorry, 14 pages long. It's a regulation under the Public Health Act. And because of this, its primary intent is to protect the public from immediate, immediate health hazards. So getting sick, getting disease from consuming sewage water is essentially the most intent of the, of the regulation. There is no requirement to address long-term sustainability or self-sufficiency of a parcel. Um, so there's no requirement to consider whether there's space for a backup system. There's um, from terms of environmental hazards, such as nitrates and phosphates, which the liquid waste management planning process has identified in the lake. Uh, there's no requirement to address those through the sewage system regulation. And so for this reason, us at Interior Health, we strongly advocate to build requirements into local regulations and business processes. The other large document that's used for regulating or administering the sewage regulation is called the Standard Practice Manual. This is a very detailed document. It's actually 367 pages long. And this is what sewage contractors uh, use or registered on-site wastewater practitioners. They must use this practice manual. Uh, and the other type of person that can do septic systems or is uh, professional engineers. And they should consider it, but they also have the ability to go outside of the standard practice and go to other jurisdictions. So they might look at the standard practices in Alberta, for example, or Washington State or something like that. So in terms of um, a property owner, the only thing that a property owner needs to do to complete uh, when it comes to constructing or repairing their septic system is to hire an authorized person. So that's through either a sewage contractor or an engineer. That's the only thing that you're tasked to do. The everything else the authorized person does. So we can see that they assess the parcel and the needs of the home. They design and construct the system and they submit all the paperwork. Uh, environmental health officers such as myself we don't have that many roles in the sewage regulation as we did in the past, in the previous regulation before this one. So all we do now is we investigate potential health hazards. So someone sees sewage on the surface of the ground and we come and investigate and determine whether it is. If it is sewage on the surface of the ground, then we order the property owner to fix it. And then that property owner has to go find an authorized person in order to, uh, to do that work. Uh, the other thing that we do is sometimes professional engineers will put in systems that are higher hazard than, um, than typical. So for example, they might put in a system that is less than 30 meters, so less than 100 feet to water. And so we would review that information to make sure that they've done all the work they're supposed to do. 
to ensure it's safe. The other thing that we do under this regulation is we issue holding tank permits. Okay, so just a crash course in septic systems. There's basic parts of septic for septic systems. This is a common language that's used. Sewerage system is the technical term. It starts off with a treatment tank. Typically, a septic tank is what we normally um, would see. There's distribution pipes that take the wastewater and uh, distribute it or bring it out to the soil and an absorption field, which are sometimes known as dispersal uh, field or a disposal field. The main thing to know is that the treatment, the main treatment is actually not in the septic tank, it's actually occurring in the soil. So the oxygen loving bacteria in the top four feet or so of the, four, of the soil, uh, that's, that's doing, the, those little bacteria are doing the majority of the work when they're doing the treatment. The other thing to note is the deeper the soil underneath the pipes before it hits groundwater, obviously the more treatment's going to happen. Uh, there's more contact with the soil, more contact with the soil bacteria. And so there'll be more treatment before the wastewater and the contaminants can reach the groundwater and then flow or move through the environment. Uh, all systems will fail. The spaces between, between the uh, soil particles. If you think about coffee grounds in a percolator on a coffee, you pour the water in and they percolate down through all those little grains of, of coffee grounds. Well, the soil is the same thing. And those little spaces between each of the particles can get clogged up. And that's what causes the septic field to fail. Once the septic field has failed, there isn't a whole lot that can be done. The best thing to do is to actually move to a new soil. So there's a half-life of approximately 35 years. So that means that half of all systems will fail by year 35. Um, and currently, many of the septic systems in the Naramata, in electoral area E in the Naramata area, they're in the 40 to 50 years old. So houses that were built, you know, the 70s, um, their, their septic systems are getting quite old. So they're at the, towards, if they're not already at the end of their life and have been replaced, they're going to be soon um, potential to be at the end of their life. So when we talk about septic systems and parcels and how to be self-sufficient, it's really important to have, at the minimum, a backup area for septic, for, for a new one, once the first one fails. So this is just, um, a little bit of terminology because you'll probably see it come up quite a bit. So there's the septic tank, that's there's different types of systems. They call them type one, type two, type three. Type one is just a septic tank. It operates with no oxygen inside. And so the, the treatment is really slow and it, the water coming, wastewater coming out of it is, is dirtier, if you could say, if you use that word, compared to type two and type three. A type two system is quite often their type two and three, they're called treatment plants. They have um, aerobic uh, oxygen is added. Quite often the air pump is in there. They blow air into it. They might even have a baffle that stirs the inside in order to um, keep it aerated and all the oxygen loving bacteria happy. It's much faster treatment, but it's also much more costly. So you have cleaner sept or effluent or wastewater coming out, but it's much more costly. And they must be maintained routinely. A septic tank, if it gets forgotten for a while, it kind of operates on its own. It can go many years with very little maintenance at all. It's not the greatest for it, but it'll still operate. The type two and type three systems, if you don't maintain them, then they're just a really poorly designed septic tank and they don't work very well at all. A type 3 system is the same as type 2. You add the oxygen, but it can also add a disinfection step. Quite often it's um, UV light uh, that could be added. And what that's doing is disinfecting the wastewater. So if the wastewater does break out onto the surface of the land, then there's less bacteria, less pathogens, disease-causing germs in that um, wastewater to cause illness. So, Last week, we were talking about affordable housing. These systems cost different amounts. The type one system, it's, it's been a while since I've been working directly with 
um, the sewage regulation, but about seven, eight years ago, a type one system was in the 10 to $15,000 range. A type two system was in the $20,000 range. And a type three system can be 40, 50, even upwards of that uh, $1,000 uh, in, in cost, depending on how complicated it is. So for interior health, we like the kids principle, keep it simple, stupid. And um, we're always advocating for enough space that a normal everyday septic system, septic tank system is the best. So these are my red flags for on-site sewage service. The more of these red flags apply to a parcel of land, the more difficult and costly it will be for that parcel to be serviced by on-site sewage and drinking water. So in the example diagram, the lot has so many constraints that the only place for a new field, once the existing field fails, is squeezed into the front yard. So I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but there's a drilled well in the top right-hand corner. There's a, uh, a dug well on the neighbor's property at the bottom of the screen. There's a creek on the left, and then there's a driveway, a house, a swimming pool. These are all typical things in people's yards. And when all of this gets filled in and all the land used up, when the septic system fails, there's very little space for a new septic to go. And to be 30 meters away from both wells and the creek, you could barely squeeze something in. I've got an orange arrow there at the right-hand side of the screen. Barely squeeze something in there. And so this is the reason why we're always advocating for larger parcels. Uh, a general rule of thumb is that is a minimum of one hectare, which is two and a half acres, for lot service by both on-site septic and drinking water. And two acres, or sorry, 0 0.2 acres, sorry, 0 0.2 hectares, which is half an acre, for lot service by on-site septic and community water systems. Of course, the larger, the better. The absolute minimum should be enough suitable land for a backup system, especially when you think of relatively dense rural residential neighborhoods. The wastewater from everyone's house comes together in the groundwater and moves under everyone's houses up through their wells or out towards the lake. So um, last week we were talking about uh, how short-term rentals can put extra pressure on the sewage system uh, and causing it to fail. So if you can see on that image there, uh, during um, the short-term rental permitting process should be really a, a time to evaluate whether the home has at least the minimum space for a backup area. And if it doesn't have backup area, then it's not a good idea for both the property owner or the community at large to allow um, short-term rental to occur there. Okay, I'm gonna switch to drinking water. So this is a drinking water crash course. There's two basic sources, surface water, groundwater. Uh, the surface water, there's more chance for pathogens, so disease-causing germs, to be in the water. A deep lake intake, there's less chance. So the Naramata water system, their intake is out towards the middle of the lake. I think it's 700 meters out and 17 meters deep. Um, and so it's less chance that they're going to have uh, bacteria and, and disease-causing germs out that far into the water. The groundwater, there's more chance for chemical hazards compared to surface water. So chemical hazards could be something like uranium or manganese, for example. Uh, in drilled wells, there's less chance um, of pathogens than in a dug well. Um, so there's some differences there. There's three levels of water system. There's a private system, which, um, you know, each a well or um, an intake from the lake for one individual home. Uh, and they, the Drinking Water Protection Act does not apply to those systems. The other systems are small community systems. So the Drinking Water, um, the Drinking Water Protection Act does apply. And they're, they are anything greater than two connections. But typically, unless they're servicing a build, like a business, like a cafe or something like that in a rural setting, um, they're typically greater than 15 connections. So they could service like a mobile home park, for example. Um, a large community water system is governed by the Drinking Water Protection Act, and it serves populations greater than 500 people. And the Naramata water system is one of those large ones. 
So in area E, uh, we have the large water system, which is the Naramata water system. And there's several, or seven there, uh, small water systems. And you can see that most of them, they're all kind of small businesses for the most part, um, except for the fire hall. And this, uh, this map here is from the Interior Health website. There's an interactive map. I'll give you the resource later on in the presentation. But um, it shows all water systems within Interior Health. You can hover your, your mouse over top of their little icons, and it gives you information and contact details uh, for each water system in Interior Health. OK, this is um, from IMAP BC. It's also an interactive. Uh, mapping system anybody can go on to and you can choose um, different filters and look at all sorts of different things um, related to uh, land in BC or, or communities in BC. For me I've selected I can see on the left hand side uh, water uses so groundwater supplies and aquifers or vulnerability. So the left hand side the green striped area which is Summerland that stands out more. That's the aquifer in Summerland. On the right hand side, it's, it's not as obvious because it almost camouflages with the hillside there. It's uh, yellowy stripes. So that's showing the aquifer um, to the uh, west, east, east. <laughs> Got my directions right. The east of Okanagan Lake. And it's showing that it's moderate vulnerability. That means that typically they, they um, quantify or, or uh, categorize the vulnerability based on the types of soils and how um, how well protected the water is from the surface and also how much the water is needed or used by humans and the people how much it's needed and so uh, it's identified as moderate the other little all the little circles you can see all the blue ones are private private domestic systems and then you can also see there's some unknowns which are the gray and there's a few, there's a couple of orange, which are irrigation and, and yellow is commercial industrial. So, but for the most part, you can see that the water systems are uh, domestic and they look to me like they're up on the bench uh, for the most part. Uh, and it's, you know, it's reasonable for us to see there aren't any in the Naramata village area, but that's because there's a community water system. Um, Oh, and then the other thing I just wanted to mention, which isn't on this map, would be uh, domestic systems or private homes along the water, uh, lake, right along the lakefront. Quite often they have intakes from the lake directly. So they're using surface water uh, for their systems. Okay, so <laughs> multiple barrier approach to drinking water. Uh, multiple barrier approach is a system of procedures processes and tools that collectively prevent or reduce the contamination of drinking water from the source to tap in order to risk, uh, reduce the risk to human health. So when our goal is to have clean, safe, reliable drinking water, we start at the source and we can protect, put protections in place for the source. We can have good treatment systems, uh, distribution systems. There's the governance that I answered back a little while ago with that other question about how do you make decisions? How are you able to apply for funding? Those sorts of things. Um, good operations and management and then monitoring and reporting. There's, this is just a simplified version of the multi-barrier approach, but you can see that all of these things are important. And the more of these that are done well, the more barriers there are from contaminants or germs or pathogens getting from the source past the treatment, past all the operations and monitoring and checking and all of those things to then finally get to the person who's going to drink it. So that's the idea behind the multiple barrier approach and it's an important concept. Uh, we also know that um, poor governance has been found to be the most correlated with long-term boil water notices or poor water quality. Uh, and that's the way one of the reasons why we strongly recommend against creation of more small water systems. Uh, we'd better for us to advocate for local governments to assume ownership and operation if the citizens are in favor, uh, or the opposite, to have small water systems privately owned uh, rather than that in-between that has a difficult time um, 
managing. Okay, so kind of back to the beginning. So when we manage our exposure and pathways, and we're thinking about sewage and drinking water in the Naramata area, we can control the sources of contamination. So we can control the quantity or the density, and we can control the type of wastewater. Uh, we can also manage where and how quickly it moves through the environment. So we can establish minimum lot sizes, for example, or oppositely, we can create community sewer systems. The other thing is um, we can apply controls just before they're entering our body, right? So we can create community water systems um, that have good um, drinking water quality, and we can advocate, encourage, require, do everything we can to get private water systems, uh, private homeowners to treat their water prior to drinking it. So that kind of back to where we started, considerations for planning and rural community. Um, the best is just keep the water and the wastewater far apart from each other. So we want to direct density to settlement areas so you can have community water and or sewer systems that are needed to achieve higher density. So we have a guideline of 0.2 hectares serviced by community water only. If we're going to do that, then keep parcels serviced by on-site sewage and water, so large water, um, so keep them large. So, so settlement areas denser and smaller and rural areas larger with a guideline of at least a minimum one hectare. Uh, it's important for governance, who and how to make decisions is significant. Uh, and then we also recommend either large systems owned by the local government or private water systems. And these are some resources and can't remember that's the end. Okay, so I'll leave it there. Um, so there's the Drinking Water for Everyone page is a great, um, a great place. It has some educational videos that are only, you know, a few minutes long, uh, each one of them. Uh, it has some really good explanations about what to look for and what all of this stuff means. Uh, there's the interactive map and then also the IMAP BC is also a really great place to play around and um, see what you can learn about your, your community. So I'll leave it there. Thanks and answer any questions. Thank you so much, Anita. That was wonderful. Um, really enjoyed the images and stuff that helps. Uh, I see Director Kazakovich has something to add here. Go ahead. Yes, thank you, uh, Danielle. Anita, excellent presentation, uh, very informative. I have a question specific to home septic systems I'm hoping you can answer because I've heard different information out there from folks. You okay. said that 35 years is an approximate lifespan on a septic system. And of course, mm -hmm. there's many old systems in the community. My understanding is that many systems, and I don't know how far back it goes, I've heard 20 years, have a second field. So they were installed with, with a field, but there's a backup field that you can connect to if your main field uh, fails. So I'm just wondering, is that true? And if that's the case, how does a homeowner find out if they have a second field? Say you bought a home and you have no idea what's under the ground. Does uh, Interior Health Authority have documents that someone can access that would educate them on their system? Thank you. Great, thanks. Um... Sure. And Danielle, if I'm still sharing, you're welcome to not have me share. I can't tell <laughs> if I am or not from my side. Um, great, thanks. Uh, so yeah, so Interior Health does have records um, for sewage systems. They, sometimes they go back to late 70s, early 80s. Somebody I think had the bright idea in the 80s to make space and they decided to get rid of a whole bunch of files. Um, not realizing that in the future they were going to be needed is my guess what happened. Uh, so some of the older properties or older septic systems might not be on file. But you can contact the Penticton Health Protection Office. And um, I think there's even on the, the Interior Health website, uh, there's um, a form you can fill out to get that information. So that's one part. So the, yes, there are septic directors. Yes, you can look for them. The other part of the question is about backup systems. So I would be highly unlikely that there was a backup system already buried and ready in the ground. Typically when they talk about a backup system is they're talking about 
does the parcel have suitable land that's far enough away from water, that doesn't have steep slopes, that doesn't have groundwater, all of those things that constrain a property. Um, somewhere, when you take all of those things into consideration, is there some place on the property that sewage can be placed? Uh, and that's what's called a backup area, or sometimes people call them a backup system or whatever. Is there enough for backup system? So you get this terminology of just backup <laughs> in general, but Typically, I, I've never seen anyone pre-build, uh, you know, build two systems at the same time uh, in the, for the future. It's just that to have enough land available in the event that the first one fails. Thank you. Um, oh, Stephen has something to add. I'm just going to add a little bit. I think um, a while back in um, about 2007, I. I do recall that some properties were having um, areas designated for a secondary field on them. Um, I'm not sure if that's still in practice, um, but I, I do remember it happening um, a, a little bit in, in Naramata. I think specifically it was the, um, the, the Stonebrook development. Um, where they would, they would uh, actually have a covenant um, placed over, over the lands. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think it's uh, in practice anymore. Yeah, so uh, yeah, we're kind of crossing over into subdivision territory. So at the time, subdivision is what we call the process of creating a brand new lot. So if you have one large lot and you decide you wanna make two smaller lots. And so during that process, uh, interior health gets involved for smaller parcels and we review them for their technical, we technically review them for their ability to support on-site septic and drinking water if that's the case. And so at the time we're trying to get um, uh, at the very minimum have a backup area. We, we're advocating for bar bigger parcels but uh, without regulations it's difficult to do that. And so the person developing the lot, they wanted to squeeze every little inch out of their property and, or out of their development. And so they tried to make their parcels really small. We didn't have very good tools in the past. And so what would happen is we'd be like, okay, you can fit a backup area, but if that backup area is used for anything else, like a swimming pool, for example, then all of a sudden you, you're in trouble in the future. And so we put covenants, it's a legal agreement on the property that says that piece of land or that part of your parcel of property can't be used for anything but sewage. The trouble is quite often people forget they're there, they're kind of a hassle, um, they're, they're just not very good to use. We now advocate to have a one, minim, one hectare minimum parcel size. Most regional districts have one hectare minimum parcel sizes and that's typically enough land to not be worried about having restrictive covenants and messing around with these other tools that aren't very good. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're a little bit over time. Skulk, you've been patiently waiting. Can you, do you have a, a short question? Uh, thanks, Danielle. I'll try and be uh, pretty short. Um, hey. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, um, you know, twice now um, we've heard all septic systems are bound to fail. Um, you know, when I think about that, I, I'm intrigued by a possible opportunity because um, uh, there was a way time back a solution proposed to put a pipeline under the water to Summerland and or Penticton. And I was wondering if that's still an option because from a risk management perspective, you know, if you compare that to an... Um, a submarine a pipeline for oil and gas, uh, the risks are extremely low. And if you compare the risks of that vis-a-vis, -vis, you've got, what, 2,000 systems here that inevitably will fail. So then you might turn around and say, well, the biggest risk here is probably to manage the public opinion, not the pipeline itself. Um, I was wondering if that's still an opportunity to be explored. Uh, I can't comment about the liquid waste management plan. I'll, I'll leave that um, to the RDOS group. But I know in the Columbia Shushwap Regional District in uh, 
Scotch Creek, so the north side of Shuswap Lake, uh, when they were going through their liquid waste management plan, one of the options that was on their table was to go under pipes under the lake over to the other side of the lake. Um, it, it never was the option that was chosen, but it was one of the ones that was listed in the phase one of their process. That wasn't, uh, that wasn't included in our uh, phase one as an option, as something I can certainly bring up uh, in, our, in our process and, and you know, I, sorry, I'm going to interject here a little bit because uh, I saw a number last time with the uh, meeting $12 million, and I started thinking, man, certainly a pipe underneath the water for three or four kilometers cannot cost $12 million. You have minimal um, costs. You don't need uh, real estate to put a plant in. You know, I can think of a thousand of uh, positives why that would be a solution, and the only thing you have to manage is public opinion. I, I think it's it's like I said before. It's something that we certainly I, I can bring up uh, as a as a potential option. Um, it's not something that we considered for Naramata. Um That was looked at for Kalidin, and it was turned down there. Just as 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 reference. So. Um, Great. Uh, yep. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is that we're still in phase one. It could be looked at as an option, but it hasn't yet at this point. Uh, Director Kazakovich, do you have something to add? Yeah, like I connected with Skulk on this because um, he did ask that question several, several years ago when sewer was sort of brought up by some folks in the community. Options were talked about just just in general as a as a dialogue maybe at a community hall meeting and it was you know do we look at piping across the lake over to Summerland to Penticton do we have our own system in the future do we try to run a pipe uh, basically somewhere along Naramata Road to connect to Penticton sewer system um, so there are different options to discuss I believe uh, though what could be a hindrance would be if um, we're trying to pipe over to Summerland and if they say no you know, we don't want to take your sewer, your your sludge or penticton. So I'm not really sure of, of how that plays out. Lisa would probably know better. Um, we may want to do it. They may not want to accept what we want to send to them. I'm not 100% sure if that can be forced on another community based on their capacity and based on what their future growth is. But it's always something uh, to look at. I, I see that uh, Lisa put a comment in, in the um, chat that the current possible option with this grant money and developer money, the goal is that it would cover the cost of, of what I often refer to as a phase one, um, which is a, a plant in the piping for down in the village core for those developers to move forward um, instead of them putting their own private systems in. And then we can look at moving out from there into future phases and that the system would be able uh, the actual treatment plant would be able to be expanded on. So it would be built to one capacity with the goal that it can be expanded on. But absolutely, scope lots of things to discuss, many options to look at and costs and um, what's the best way to deal with this in the village core should it move forward. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Okay, I, I do see Richard's got questions in hands, but we need to move on to water to make sure we have enough time. So I'm going to hand it over to Stephen Juke here in the boardroom. I'll just start sharing the screen for him and uh, let him take it away. Great. Thank you, Danielle. Yeah, I'm Stephen Juke. I'm the um, development engineering supervisor. Uh, my main role for quite a while now has been um, assisting in the process of subdivision and development and uh, facilitating all the infrastructure that's usually needed for it. Um, today, we are going to look at uh, review the Naramata water system um, rather quickly. Um, a lot of you are long-time uh, Naramation, sorry, 
uh, uh, so you probably know a lot of the history already, but uh, here we go. Um, okay, click on that. There we go. Okay, so um, the water system was transferred to uh, the RDOS from the Naramata Irrigation District in 1996. Um, back then, there were four water sources, two lake and two creek sources. And the creek sources were only used for seasonal purposes during uh, irrigation periods. Um, the picture shown is uh, the service area for the Naramata water system as it is today. Uh, a little bit of background. Um, the connections to the system are primarily domestic or for residential and irrigation. Um, there certainly are um, a, a small amount of commercial, institutional, and of course, um, uh, winery production. Um, there are four main water reservoirs. There's the McKay, Juniper, Arowana, and Stonebrook. And currently there's one uh, other reservoir that is in um, development at this time. Catch up here. Um, as you can see, our 2020 uh, total usage was uh, just under 1.5 cubic or million cubic meters. Um, our water licensing is roughly 2.3 cubic. A million cubic meters of water. So um, if you can't picture a cubic meter, it's uh, about three feet by three feet by three feet. Um, the water treatment facility uh, was constructed in 2008 and that's at uh, McKay Road and it has ultraviolet and chlorine treatment. So here's some pictures uh, uh, of our system. Uh, this is our water, raw water intake uh, down at the Okanagan Village. Um, these are the pumps in the intake pump house. Uh, this is our new um, uh, backup power generator at the McKay Water Treatment Facility. And these are the UV, UV treatment um, lights that are used to disinfect the water. So we've done a lot of upgrades since um, the takeover of, of the system. Um, like I said, we centralized the, uh, the treatment facility at McKay in 2008, and we also changed it to a single source, which is down at the village. Um, we still have the creek intakes as emergency backup systems um but uh the the secondary um lake intake was taken offline and it's it's now uh completely gone um we in 2008 we also uh had the water reservoir in stonebrook um constructed as part of the stonebrook development uh 2014 we had generators installed uh down at um the raw water pump house and also at McKay. And we've done quite a bit of uh, major pipe replacement projects. Um, uh, most of it was through grant funding. Um, and it was, as you can see on the, on the slide, um, the one of the last major ones was uh, for Naramata Road, Heyman and part of Juniper as probably most of you remember for all the traffic woes everyone had in the summer. Uh, so the system, the Aramata water system is, is operated uh, by the regional district. We have the regional board and uh, the electoral area E director as, as oversight on the system. Um, we also have regional district staff. They're broken up into operations department and engineering. Operations uh, runs the day-to-day -day on the system. Uh, we have qualified operators um, that have, uh, I believe, up to level four certification on the system. Level four is extremely difficult, and uh, um, but we need that 
that level of certification because uh, the Naramata system is um, a type four system, which has a lot of pressure zones and, and variables in it. Um, the engineering uh, staff, they look after the, the planning and the capital works um, development and yeah, just generally trying to make sure that the, uh, the water system is operating at, uh, efficiently. So we have some service objectives. Um, basically, the main objective, of course, is to provide quality water or potable water, as it is. We have um, our domestic and irrigation services uh, get the same water, uh, so it is potable. Um, but also, we have a quantity that we want to ensure. Uh, that means that we have capacity within the system, in the distribution system. Uh, for example, in the summertime, um, as you know, Naramata is uh, primarily agricultural and 85% of our water demand uh, at peak summer flow is for irrigation. So we have to ensure that we have enough water flowing through the pipes for everybody. Uh, just as important is, is fire protection. Fire protection is um, made up in various things, like, for example, the, the fire department is part of fire protection. Uh, the water system is uh, one of the components of protection, and it's mainly, uh, again, for uh, quantity of water for the demand period of, of, of fire protection. Um, another level of service is conservation. Um, you know, we want to ensure that the water is used uh, the way it's supposed to be used. We don't want it wasted. Um, also, you know, reasons for that is, you know, we need to make it sustainable and to make it work um, by using less energy, less water, and um, to, uh, to educate the, the residents and, and the users of the water to, to use it wisely. And also, um, nowadays, it's uh, climate change mitigation. Um, we have, as everyone has seen uh, over the last years, uh, flooding and, and fires going on um, more frequently. And, um, you know, our infrastructure has to adapt. And uh, we do have uh, provincial oversight over us. Um, uh, the water systems uh, do have to adhere to um, the Drinking Water Protection Act and also the Water Sustainability Act. Um, and also there are uh, many other provincial regulations that are, are, are relating to um, those two acts and, and other acts. So in saying that at our uh, local government level, we have established uh, many relevant bylaws. Um, the establishment bylaw actually sets the service area for the, um, for the water system to provide water. Um, this was uh, adopted, like I said, in, in the beginning in 1996. It has been amended um, uh, several times for the service area. Um, it not only um, provides us uh, a scope of what we're supposed to do, which is provide and supply the treatment and conveyance and storage and distribution of water, but it also um, gives us, uh, um, allows us to recover the cost for that service. Um, and then also a mechanism to recover costs are development cost charges um, basically, these are when someone wants to come into the system. Um, we talked a little bit about it in the liquid waste management planning uh, session. Um, we do have a, a, an established bylaw. Um, this bylaw will be reviewed once the OCP is, is completed, and it's primarily based on um, uh, what type of growth happens in the area. Um, that's designated the, in, in the water service area. The Southern Servicing Bylaw. Um, this bylaw, it, it's a little bit of a, a misnomer calling it a, 
a, a, the subdivision bylaw, um, but um, most local governments do. Um, this sets out the standards for uh, what our water system should be. So, for example, um, minimum pipe sizes. Um, if you have a, a, a hydrant, you have to have a, a six-inch pipe. That's, uh, that's, a, that's a standard um, in that bylaw. Um, and it also identifies the levels of service um, for development based on the land use and um, lot sizing. Um, we have just recently updated our water use regulatory bylaw. Um, this is actually a, a bylaw for all our water systems. Um, it establishes the terms and conditions under which we operate the water systems and also it um, regulates how we like to see the water being used. Again, it goes back to uh, conservation measures. Um, the cross connection control bylaw, um, that's relatively, again, a new bylaw. Um, it protects public health by minimum, minimizing backflow and controlling cross connections. Um, a cross connection is where um, a, a, a where the water may get contaminated um, by uh, a possible um, suction uh, from from the system. Like for example, if a fire hydrant ha is opened, um, that may cause water to be actually sucked towards the hydrant, and and if if there is um, something in in a service or, or or somehow a contaminant gets into the into the system that's that's cross connection and so we're trying to um obviously avoid that um by using backflow preventers and and other mechanisms and then also our fees and charges bylaw the bylaw this bylaw sets out the fees and charges uh for us to collect to recover the cost for operating um the near metal water system Okay, so um, ongoing improvements. Um, you know, the, the regional district staff are constantly trying to improve the system, um, uh, uh, adhere to what levels of service we have. The water operators, um, you know, their main concern is uh, annual maintenance and, and, and quality of water. Um, also, uh, as a conservation off, uh, measure, but also for for tracking use of the system um, metering. Um, and it also helps us uh, for leak detection on not only services, but also um, uh, in the main pipes. Um, water modeling, that's uh, a relatively new tool for us. Um, that's a, a computer generated model of the water system. Um, we are able to um, assess demands on the system that we haven't quite, that we haven't built yet um, to show where the deficiencies are in the system. For example, uh, we can model the, the fire flow requirements of, of an area and show where um, a hydrant might be needed or, or increase in pipe size. And then also um, capital works planning, which is, which is a big part of uh, the engineering function. Um, and that is uh, a constant ongoing um, uh, development of replacement of undersized pipes, um, aging infrastructure. For example, um, you know, the original pipe in uh, from the Naramata Irrigation District, that it dates back to 1957-59 uh, era, um, and it's definitely time uh, to uh, replace those type of pipes. And uh, also just meeting all our regulatory requirements under the legislation and, and the various provincial ministries. Okay, and um, so this is kind of gets, gets down to um, what uh, talking about this is all about is, is levels of service for, for the community. Um, uh, in my mind, um, this, is, this is really what, what should be stated in the OCP is, is really what, what levels of service does the does the um, does the community want in their domestic irrigation fire flows? And I put down there, Matta Center, 
um, because that's that's been brought up uh, tonight, but also um, uh, with the change of um, with potential densities, that also changes the levels of service. For example, fire hydrants might be closer together um, for medium density versus um, low density properties. So um, that's that's sort of a uh, something to think about and, and possibly have some questions on is, is what, what's the expectations of levels of service? Um, so to pay for everything, um, you know, that's, that's always on the mind of, minds of people. Um, we have op annual operating costs. Um, those are generally um, looked at uh, or, or paid for through our water rates, which is our fees and charges bylaw. Capital works. Um, a lot of the, the projects cost quite a bit of money. Um, so we go out and try to get grant funding. Um, typically grant funding is um, a two thirds grant and a one third community uh, funding source. Um, and then also we have uh, reserve funds. Um, uh, the DCC is is a type of reserve fund. Um, we also have various other funds, uh, capital reserve funds that uh, uh, that we kind of store up and um, use when we want to do our, our capital works plans. And then, of course, uh, development growth. Um, if someone wants to come into um, and develop a property or come into the service area, um, of the water system. Um, it is a, uh, basically a, a user pay kind of, kind of system. Um, we have to ensure that the, um, what is proposed is sustainable for the community system to, to maintain. And if it's not, then, um, uh, the development has to, um, upgrade our system. Uh, the Stonebrook Reservoir, for example, is, is an example of, of that growth. Um, that was a, uh, I think, uh, point or $800,000 expenditure for, for the development. Um, and that was a great community benefit, um, to, to help with, um, with the water system. Okay. Community engagement, um, being a, uh, a regional district, um, we, like to go and communicate such as what we're doing right now. Uh, we do have an Aramata water advisory committee, um, uh, in Aramata. It was established, uh, when the, um, water system was taken over. Um, it's a longstanding committee. Um, uh, we go to them and, uh, let them know what, uh, how the operations are going. Um, and we uh, ask for feedback from them. Um, they are, uh, uh, I think, a, a few of you in, in, in this group tonight are, are part of that committee. Um, and then also just the general public. Um, we go to consultation um, for any type of capital works projects. Uh, we do newsletters with our, with our uh, billing, typically, and also... Um, when uh, when big projects happen, um, we try to get input from from the general public. And that's it for me. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Thank you, Stephen. I just going to get away from this share screen so I can see what you are saying. Ah, OK. I know there's been things going through the chats, but I have not been able to follow it because I was on a different screen. So if you have a question that you still need answered, please raise your hand. Um, I see Richard is at the top of the list. Please go ahead. Can you switch? Oh. Thank you. Um, I, I just, uh, just before I get started on the questions, because I've got a few of them, uh, will we be moving on to uh, the general servicing part of the discussion after this? Uh, we're covering that on April 26th. I included it in the worksheet for this as well, just because it also has to do with water and sewer. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, that makes it a lot easier because uh, I got a bunch of questions for that too. Uh, so this would be a question, I guess, for uh, Stephen. Um, uh, looking at the OCP uh, 21.1.1.3, um, it says that the regional board will liaise with the province and the plan area water purveyors to ensure an overall coordinated water management strategy for water quality and quantity. Is this being done? That I don't know, um, and I, I apologize for that. I, I'm more on the development side. I know that we do talk regularly with um, the Okanagan Water Board or Wa Okanagan Basin Water Board, um, and also we we have regular communications with Interior Health uh, relating to water quality. There are um, standards that we do have uh, we have regular water sampling throughout all our water systems um, and we also produce a um, uh, an annual water report um, on on the water systems thanks Stephen um, yeah it would be nice to know if the uh, regional board is uh, liaising um, in accordance uh, with the province uh, as the OCP requires of it. Um, another question, um, the item four in that same uh, part of the OCP reads uh, that the regional board encourages that potential developers of lands uh, above the Kettle Valley Railway and uh, the North Bench of Naramata undertake an engineering study for future expansion of the water system to those areas. Uh, I'd like to suggest to the uh, to the group that we may want to think about changing that to requires rather than in uh, developers being encouraged to do it uh, that we would require that the OCP would require it. Um, and then it also says uh, that um, that a we will implement a stage program where users incur the full cost of the water and one sector does not unjustifiably subsidize another. Um, do you know if that is being done? Again, I, I would have to look into that, Richard. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, that's, that's a little bit beyond my, uh, my, my, my realm in the, in, in the operation. Um, I, I will have to say um, when a developer does come into the system, um, we do require uh, engineering reviews uh, to be conducted on, on the system. Um, for example, the water modeling, uh, we want to see if, if uh, not only what they're going to be constructing, but how that impacts the rest of the system. Um, and and that's, that's part of the process. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move on just because there's quite a few hands up. Uh, but if you have more, Richard, just write it in because we have lots. Um, Stephanie, you are next. Thanks very much. I'll try to keep these short. I'm just wondering about the capacity of our um, treatment and delivery of, of water system. Um, given the number of underdeveloped or undeveloped lots, how close is the water system to its maximum treatment and delivery system? And you mentioned uh, that there was a fifth reservoir that's going if being developed or is required to be developed. And is that due to capacity issues? Maybe you could just explain how that works. Yeah, the, the reservoirs are, are needed um, primarily for fire protection. Um, you know, they do... Um, uh, allow balancing of, of, of the water systems, um, but it's it's not necessarily a, a, a capacity issue. Um, we are uh, within our water licensing, um, and we 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 will be for for quite a while. Um, one of the things that uh, that we're we're going to be conducting as well again through the water modeling is to um, 
is to try to answer the questions that, that, that you're kind of asking is, is what, uh, what is the amount of um, water needed for, for full build out? Um, it's, it's one of those type of uh, extreme scenarios, uh, but it, it is something that we, we do need to, to run. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, I have a, a similar question written in front of me here that says, um, the Naramata OCP currently says we would have about a 1.5% per year growth. Uh, is the amount of water we have on water licenses sufficient to allow for that growth and continued agriculture? I'm sorry, can, can you repeat that? Uh, so <laughs> given the water licenses that we have, yes. is there enough water to continue with 1.5% population growth per year in addition to continuing agriculture? Um, at, at, at this time, yes. Yep, yes, there is. Okay. Um, Alan, I saw your hand flip by. Did you have something or you changed your mind? I'm fine. It's been answered. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Director Kazakovich. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, um, in mentioning the population growth in the OCP, the 1.5%, um, just so everyone's aware, we um, have gone about 20 years with no growth. We actually had a decline in growth when we look at the federal census over the past, um, every five years we get an update. So we were roughly around uh, just under 2,000 people back in 1996 or so. And 2011, we were 1,844 people. 2016, we finally got an increase to 1,903 people. And then we just had the 20, um, 2021 census come out and we just cracked out, out of the 2000 mark. So we're at 2015 people in electoral area E. So essentially in 20 years, we've had a growth of about 20 people. Um, I think we're going to see continued growth because we now know that we've got um, lots that are being built on and we should see some increased growth. But I just wanted everyone to be aware that um, from the uh, OCP that's being reviewed now with that figure in it, we have not had um, population growth, but I think it, it's something we will see start to happen. Thanks, Danielle. Thank you. Um, and I'll definitely be bringing the updated census statistics forward in future meetings because they'll be important for further discussions. Um, just looking in the comments here, do does anyone have a question that has not yet been addressed? I see uh, Stephanie ahead. I just had a quick follow up to what Carl is saying. I think that's really interesting that we haven't had that much growth, but we've also had tremendous growth in the last year, right? It's quite interesting to see the number of lots that have been sold and are being built. Um, so I think it was, I appreciated your comments, Steve, about, um, you know, that you're going to be doing a, an assessment of, of capacity versus uh, growth and, and development. Mm -hmm. It's certainly interesting as well with the number of lots that have been built and sold with the number of people who actually live in the community year round versus not year round. It's uh, looking like just over 40% of privately held properties in electoral area E are owned by people whose primary address is not in the community. Um, Director Kazakovich has another clarification. Yeah, thank you. And then thanks, Stephanie, for that comment. Um, a suggestion that when we started the OCP process last year, and I'm not sure if I mentioned it when we were um, doing our likes and dislikes, but I'm wondering, and, and this might be a question for you, Danielle, when we look at the OCP that we will put into place with a growth rate, should we look at two categories? Should there be a population growth rate, but should there also be a a housing growth rate, because we've certainly seen an increase in the number of houses that has grown. Um, and, and it's two different 
think. So when people talk about growth, they assume we've had a population increase because they see more houses going in when, in when that's not reality. So I'm just wondering if the OCP should tackle two categories of growth. Yeah. Good. Thanks. I, yes, I agree. Uh, we've been talking about that here as well with the liquid waste management plan that uh, the potential for housing under the current zoning as it is, is quite high because there's underdeveloped lots, but that may or may not result in population growth, depending on if they're secondary homes or principal homes. Um, Danielle, just a quick clarification on a comment you made. Um, the 40% you alluded to uh, people not living here, but owning here, is that from 2016 or 2021 stat or is that current kind of understanding that's from our property stats so th that would be the addresses that people have on title if their address is not an address in the community which okay. could have changed between when we get that data and where they're actually living um but it, it's fairly current yeah okay thanks problem um i'm going to take cheryl's hand and then we'll likely wrap this up because we're i i don't want to keep you all too late. So Cheryl, please go ahead. Thank you. I, I see that we're over time already. I'll be quick. I see in the current OCP um, that it says uh, that the board wants to promote the increased efficiency of agricultural irrigation water management, which I can understand, especially with Stephen's comment that in the summer, 85% of the water use goes to agricultural. And I was just wondering um, how the board might promote that and could there be incentives for orchardists to um, make changes so that their irrigation systems are more efficient? Uh, yeah, one, one of the things that um, uh, has been uh, a pilot project in Naramata is, is putting meters in, in, the, um, in the community, uh, various orchards and residents are, are metered now. Um, and that just allows um, the regional district and and the property owners to, to see how much they are using. Um, I know that uh, the water operators are working constantly with with uh, any water user in there, Matta, to to promote more efficient use of the water. Um, but I, I'm not aware of any ongoing program right now. Yeah, it's just the, the cost of changing out an orchard's um, irrigation system is pretty significant. And, um, you know, the farmers aren't necessarily able to bear that cost. So right. I was just curious if there was any other way and to support. A, a lot of it is is also just leak detection, just knowing whether or not that there's there's a leak in the system. Um, and that's not just for, for orchardists and, 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 and farmers, it's for, for households. Um, we, we, the RDOS has had experience in other communities where, you know, there was huge amounts of water, uh, just, just going missing and, and no one was aware of it until, uh, until the meters were placed. Um, so it, it, it meters are, are a good way to, to at least, uh, know whether or not leak detection is there, um, but yeah, there, there's there's other other mechanisms, um, you know, uh, that that we're we're trying. Um, it's just uh, uh, just an ongoing project uh, with with the uh, with the operators. Thank you. Okay, Richard, I see you've dropped your question here. Um, I just I, actually, I just wanted to make a comment on the um, the the secondary homes um, in regards to uh, the water system and, and other infrastructure. Um, you know, it's 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 challenging for for the water systems because they, you know, they they are designed based on the premise that you know you 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 put a pipe in the ground, you build a house. It's it, it's going to be used and and, and the water is going to be used. Um, you know, we have, uh, for example, uh, for water quality, we have to make sure that we have uh, adequate chlorine in the system and that does dissipate. Um, so at times 
we have to go out and uh, and release water um, in areas that uh, you know there's not enough water use, and, and sometimes during the winter um, that happens because the the secondary homes are uh, are not being used or not being used enough. So and that and that could also impact uh, people's septic systems as well. For example. Okay. Um, last question, and then I'm going to close this. What is the maximum amount of water that can be delivered by the current system? Is it... <laughs> we can answer that one after. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I honestly don't know. I would, I would have to uh, ask, ask engineering or, uh, or the operators. Okay. On that, I want to close this so we don't all stay too late. I said 8.30, um, and I want to respect your time. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful night. If you have outstanding questions, do send them to me. I have ones here from Richard, Stephanie, uh, David, Deb, Skulk, and Greg. So we will be putting out a document that answers those. I'll try to elicit uh, responses from Tanya and Anita and Stephen and Dustin. Um, and thank you very much for your time presenting and participating, everyone. Thank you, Danielle, and thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Good night.